Welcome back to another episode of Time Out with the Sports Doctor podcast. I'm very glad to have you back for another week, and we have another very special guest for you. Uh, today we have Mr. Jason Shin. Um, he is an executive coach. He is a resilience coach. Um, he is a three-time startup founder. He is also a Guinness Book of World Record holder. So that's definitely a first on Time Out with the Sports Doctor podcast and a former gymnast. So Jason, welcome to the show. Glad to have you here. Are you interested in real estate? Are you tired of hearing about all the money that your friends and colleagues are making from their investments, but you don't know where to start? Don't worry, I got you. We are teaming up with Dr. Ronnie Shalev and Shawin Properties to equip you with the tools you need to feel empowered about your investments. So how do you get involved? Do these three things. First, go to my website at drderickthesportsdoctor.com and click on the sponsor link for Shawin Properties. This will give you access to a free webinar as well as the ability to have a discovery call with Dr. Ronnie Shalev. Also follow her on social media and stay tuned for more helpful tips coming at you on Money Mondays. Now back to the episode. It's so great to be here. Really fun. And um, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So before we start recording, he is a friend of Mariko Gordon. And as I said, she is almost co-host of Time Out with a Sports Doctor. She's been really good and sending a lot of very brilliant people my way. And I really appreciate that. Um, and, you know, I'm just glad to have you here. Glad to share your story because it is a very unique story. And I think it'll help a lot of people. I love Mariko. So I'm so glad we have that connection. Uh, should we talk first about gymnastics and sports since that's, you know, a big topic of your podcast and, and you know, how sports medicine comes into play there? Absolutely. Yeah. So let, let's talk about your early life as a gymnast. Well, what age did you actually start being a gymnast? Because I know it's usually a very young age if you're going to be competitive. Yeah. So I actually started gymnastics when I was about six years old and it was kind of by accident, although in retrospect, is anything ever by accident? Um, right. my, we immigrated from China when I was three years old and, you know, I was an ADHD kid, hyperactive, bouncing off the walls, like kind of disrupting the classrooms. Gymnastics was a real grounding place. Well, first of all, my mom was a gymnast, gymnast herself in China. She came to the U S you know, looking for work. When first thing she did all kinds of things, cashier, all that, but she also started working in a gymnastics facility. And obviously that's the kind of, she really thrives. She loves helping develop people. So you can say coaching is kind of in my my blood, but so was gymnastics, right? So I started in the gym, kind of like a daycare, just put you in there, make sure you're not making trouble. But, you know, over time I got, I got better and, and I got into it and, you know, I started competing when I was eight years old. And then uh, by the time I was 10, I was showing some promise and I was, uh, and, and training longer hours. By the time I was 11 years old, I was training maybe like 18 to 20 hours a week and competing in national level competitions for my age group. And so it, it really was where I grew up in a lot of ways and, and taught me so many lessons. And then, you know, went on to compete in high school gymnastics, club gymnastics, US junior national team, NCAA, all that, uh, that kind of stuff. And we can get into it, but that's sort of how it, it first began almost as a, as a place to disperse excess energy. Wasn't right. really something she thought would necessarily become like a real, yeah, career or achievement kind of track for me. So you mentioned 18 to 20 hours a week at what age? Starting really like 11 and 12 years old. Yeah. Okay. But that's not, that's not unusual, right? For gymnasts. If you're starting to compete and be serious about it. Yeah. It's, it, you know, you're in the gym, maybe five, six days a week, three to four hours uh, a day. So, you know, that adds up. And what about injuries? You know, I know you had an injury later in life, but how did your body hold up at that young age to, you know, jumping, flipping at that young age, that many hours a week? Yeah, well, I think early on, I was pretty lucky. We didn't train super hard at first. I got more serious in high school, but in, you know, elementary school, middle school, I was fairly lucky, you know, I broke my ankle, had some, you know, dislocated fingers, things like that, you know, a couple of like, hit the back of your head on some piece of equipment and, you know, it's real bloody, but this is a flap, you know, and they just stitch yeah. the flap up <laughs> and you're okay. Um, 
So, you know, I didn't start getting, you know, more chronic injuries. And in, in, I think high school, I started to have some shoulder pain. Um, and, you know, that's where I started learning a lot more about prehab and, you know, just like a lot of, a lot more strength conditioning to kind of build up, um, you know, my body so that I could tolerate the, the kind of pounding and all that. Yeah. So I can tell you from an orthopedic surgeon standpoint, a gymnast is one of the hardest athletes to treat because it's very hard to get a gymnast to ever leave the gym. You know, <laughs> like you mentioned, oh, a little broken ankle, a little broken finger, it's dislocated finger, it's a little laceration. You know, they're always like, hey, I got this big competition on Saturday. Can I go? Yeah, that's true. That is definitely true. I had, um, I remember one of my worst injuries as a kid was I, um, kind of landed like on the back of my neck off of the high bar and on a landing kind of bad. I like miss, you know, was I doing one flip or two flips? I kind of got a little confused in the air. And yeah. so I went one and a half, you know, a little splat and, you know, you, you shake it off during the day. And then the next day you wake up and you like, can't move your neck. You're like, <laughs> because it all got locked up. Right. And yeah. you know, I didn't break anything, but it was, it was bad. And I had a knee, or not a brace, a, a neck brace. So I got that full thing around your neck and you're like, oh, and I was, you know, going to nationals. And so I was on the, you know, regional team and I was supposed to compete. And then they're like, are you going to compete for the regional team or not? And then all this stuff about like, you know, somebody else needs to swap in. And I ended up competing like two events. Uh, so not my sort of full roster of six events, but, you know, I didn't want to just show up there and then not compete. And I was like, right. But that's exactly to your point. Like, sometimes you need a break. Right. <laughs> All right. So gymnastics, was was that your key to going to Stanford on a scholarship? Yeah. I mean, I think I knew I wanted to compete in uh, college athletics. It was a very exciting opportunity. And, and I've always loved that camaraderie. I think in club gymnastics, you really are alone. You're competing on your own. And then I did some high school gymnastics too, which a lot of club athletes don't do because it's sort of like, well, what's the point? It's sort of a waste of time. You're not competing with those guys in your high school. They're not serious, right? But I knew some some other people who from my old club who went to my high school who were like, you got to show up. And so, you know, even with my coach not wanting me to do that, I did that. And I really built a lot of friendships there. And, you know, I was kind of a nerd growing up, like really into books and, and studying when I wasn't in the gym. So even though I was like, it's funny because there's sort of this idea that like all athletes are, are like jocks and, you know, they're right. cool and they're just roaming around this. But that wasn't really the case for me as a gymnast, you know, you're a small guy and nobody, you know, you're, you're the guy prancing around tights, but like doing <laughs> high school gymnastics kind of gave me some of that street cred, right? Like people came out to the competitions and they're like, oh snap, like that's really hard. That's cool. Jason's like actually really good. So you built my yeah. confidence, even though in some ways you could have said it was like maybe not the best use of my time, but uh, between, you know, I think I had pretty good standardized test scores because I just really like dial in on, um, you know, I have, I have ADHD. And so like when it comes to like the big tests, I get real fired up and I'm like all about it. And I want to, you know, give it my all. But when it's like day to day, like the homework, every assignment, every quiz, like I did okay. You know, I did okay. Mm -hmm. And that B plus A minus range. But then, you know, the, the standardized test I did well. And then combination of that plus the gymnastics put me into the mix for Stanford. It was either Stanford or like, you know, University of Minnesota or like Penn State. They are all schools that had gymnastics programs. Um, but luckily Stanford wanted me on a partial scholarship. So I, I went out. And where, where did you live before move, going to Stanford? I grew up in the uh, suburbs of Boston. So that's where we immigrated when we moved from China. And then going to California was, you know, a trip. It was, it was so much fun. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. What was that adjustment like? Because I know Stanford, that, what is that, Palo Alto area? Yeah. Very expensive, very exclusive. How did you adjust to that? Well, you know, they say it's like a bubble. So I really did feel like um, I wasn't even in that surrounding area. You know, I was just on campus. And okay. I remember that first month was like the most exciting month of my life because there was just so much freedom, you know, that my, my day had been so regimented, like get up, go to school, go to, you know, high school gymnastics, then go to my regular program. I wasn't getting home till like 9 30, 10 o'clock eating dinner, then doing my homework. So it was a pretty, you know, the winter, I wouldn't see the sun basically, you know, wow. 
And so just being like, oh, you got classes, classes end at one o'clock, you got practice till two, but then it ends at six and then you still got some time. It was, it was really fun. Um, but, you know, in retrospect, I think I grew up, you know, with immigrant family, like we did okay for ourselves. And, but you only realize in retrospect, like, man, some of these people were so wealthy, right? So many right. of these people who go to these elite schools are, I just have come from so much money and, and, you know, they do their best to try to bring some folks who, who, you know, on needs based scholarship or what have you, but, uh, it's, it's, you know, the smaller fraction, right. And I definitely did feel like separation from myself with a lot of students, but I never really understood why. And in retrospect, it's like, duh, it's obvious. Like they're, they, you know, they, they grew up so differently from you. Um, sure. but luckily the gymnastics team, I kind of inherited a group of friends and, you know, I really did feel like it was also, you know, a, a chance to learn like masculine coded behavior, like how guys kind of interact in groups. You know, I really learned that kind of back slapping, you know, bro, bro, <laughs> yeah. bro, that, you know, kind of style. And, you know, I'll, I'll kind of flip into that when my teammates and I all go meet, meet up for somebody's wedding. But, you know, it was valuable, but it was also kind of like, not exactly me, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So did you feel a lot of pressure as a first generation Chinese immigrant? Was there a pressure that you put on yourself or maybe pressure that your family put on you to succeed? Yeah, pressure is a great question. I do feel like I had a lot riding on my shoulders. I wanted to show my parents that they had done a good job and it really like set me up. So yeah, I definitely felt that way. And I have a younger sister who was born 12 years after I was born. So really big difference, right? Mm -hmm. uh, she mm -hmm. was going to elementary school when I went off to college or she was going to kindergarten. So we, we grew up like totally apart and she doesn't feel that at all, right? She's sort right. of like, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to live my life, enjoy my life. And I'm like, I need to achieve, I need to be, do more. And like, I can't retire my parents and that kills me, you know, like, they're, I mean, they're, they're pretty much retired, but it's that kind of retirement where you're like, okay, we got to watch every dollar. We're not just like taking it for granted. Right. And I wish I'm 36 now. I wish I was at that point where I was already could be like, mom, dad, don't even worry about it. Like, just go on vacation, stay on vacation. You know, your son's got this. And yeah. so it, it is painful to be able to not be able to say that. And sometimes I'm on the phone with my mom. She's like, don't work so hard. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like who taught me to work hard? <laughs> right. And I'm not ready to let go now. So yeah, I did, I did feel pressure. So as a three-time startup founder, would you attribute that more to your family or more to your Stanford experience? You know, because I know that in that environment, there's so many creatives and so much business and especially in that area, Silicon Valley. What do you attribute to your entrepreneurship drive? Yeah, it's absolutely a combination. You know, some people grew up in families where, you know, uh, my, my wife's parents um, started a series of restaurants. And so she kind of like saw that entrepreneurship up close in her life. Uh, for me, my mom was a gymnastics coach. My dad worked for the state government in education. So he had a very stable job. They weren't really demonstrating those like entrepreneurial qualities uh, growing up. I liked computers. I was one of those kids who got the sort of first modems back in the day and those early computers getting on the internet doing stuff, but uh, coding wasn't really my thing. So I kind of was like, I don't know, I like computers, but I code, I don't think I can be a software programmer. So what do I do? And, and so Stanford did show me that there were these other ways of operating that, that kind of allowed me to participate in this startup ecosystem. And, you know, I'm old enough to know, remember when like Facebook just came out and it wasn't available in my school yet, in my yeah. college yeah. even, it was like just Harvard, then the Ivy League, and I'm like, come on, when does it come to Stanford? And then, yeah. you know, so I saw all of that, right? And a lot of people did, but uh, it's, it's sort of, so it's a combination of inherent interest in, in technology, Stanford showing me what's possible. And then I think that ADHD drive to want to do something new, want to be in control of my own destiny, wanting to kind of like, I just don't feel like I could have a 25 year career in one place the way my dad did. And I'm like, I can't, I can't just hang on like that. You know, he's kind of patient like that. I'm like, I gotta be doing something new. You gotta be doing something big. And so startups were a good fit in that way. 
All right. So let's continue on the startup because we definitely got to talk about the injury and kind of resilience, but let's continue with startups because yeah. you're talking to, you know, a lot of medical professionals, a lot of other athletes as well, but you know, serial startups is a buzzword that I can't say I necessarily understand. So tell kind of walk me through that process. Yeah. So, you know, the kind of startups that I've been involved in are venture backed startups, which means that there are investors who come in fairly early on who want to buy a, a small percentage of the company. Um, and what they're really doing is buying a chance at a really big outcome. So mm -hmm. this is unlike, you know, going to your bank or going to the SBA and trying to get a loan to start, you know, a coffee shop where you said, look, you know, the chances of success are pretty good. I scoped out this area or I'm going to let, you know, uh, do a subway franchise, right? Like those are relatively low risk. Like they could still not work, but you know, you're selling the sandwiches, you're selling the coffee, you, you've got a thing and the likelihood of you going to zero are like less than, let's say, you know, less than 30, 40%, right? Like you can make some money back or if it's like going really badly, you can say, okay, let's unwind this and sell the, sell some of the equipment. And then, you know, you, you're never going to come out with zero, right? Uh, yeah. If you're, if you're smart. Um, but with these venture back startups, the idea is you see an opportunity for something big, something potentially really big. We're talking about Facebook, we're talking about Uber, Airbnb, Apple, you know, these are all companies that were venture backed, which means that it can lose money at first um, and spend a lot and grow quickly, but then eventually turn around and make, you know, really big amounts of money. And, you know, you see Uber still struggling to make money. And so there are times where it doesn't even work out even after all that money has gone into it. But on the other hand, you see a company like Facebook or Google or Apple or Microsoft, Amazon, all venture back companies that make crazy amounts of money. And the people who invested in those companies early on made a ton. We're not talking about like, oh, the stock market, if you make 15% back, that's, you know, that's sort of pretty good, right? You make 25, 30, 50%. You're like, wow, you're amazing. You make 40% on the stock market year after year. That's amazing. With yeah. these investments, you can make, you know, a hundred times, a thousand times your investment. Some of the early, you know, folks made so much, but the, the other side of it is that a lot of them go to zero, right? A lot of them or like barely make their money back. And that's, you know, uh, to that, to those investors, it's, it's nothing like it's no point, you know, you double the investment, who cares? That's not the point. The point is yeah. I'm, I want something that has a chance of being hundred X or more. Um, so these guys are high risk, high reward. They're going to be billionaires. They're not trying to be a millionaire, correct? Well, the way it works is even these investors have their own investors, right? So okay. it's it's like, it's just investors all the way around, right? Like yeah. these guys, they run a fund. The fund comes out. Some of it's their own money. Some of it is, you know, high net worth individuals. Some of it is like pension funds, right? Like pension funds or nonprofits will invest some of their endowment. Stanford's got a huge endowment. Some of that's in different VC funds. So they all, everybody's kind of like still, um, it's not just their own money, right? And their goal right. is no to way. beat the stock market ultimately, right? Like, yes, they want those hundred Xers, but they know they're gonna eat a lot of zeros. So you, the goal is just to balance out and beat the stock market and be another source of capital returns. You got like real estate, you got like, gold, you got like stock market, and then you got venture capital as a sort of another category of, of, of investment. The Sabre training bat is like no other training bat you've ever used before. So the purpose of the Sabre training bat with its modified barrel is so that you can perfectly sequence and get behind the ball, getting the bat on plane sooner creating less miss hits, more line drives, higher batting averages, and more exit velocity. The Sabre training bat is the number one training bat on the market. Sabre bats, the training bat that's gonna take you to your best swing. Yeah, I mean, man, this is so foreign. You know, I, we've talked a lot about money on this podcast and assets and growing your assets and you know we're doing a money mondays where we're talking about things of this nature but it's still such a different mindset from you know in medicine you want everything to be perfect versus business is okay we'll give this a try if it doesn't work out we'll pull our money out and put it somewhere else you know so it's just a different frame of thought 
and it's you know it's always nice to hear someone that thinks just almost totally different uh, but i'll from tell them. you it's it's challenging as someone who is a first generation immigrant to yeah. think as big as you kind of need to because you really got to be okay with total failure and i think in a lot of ways the three companies i worked on the first one we actually kind of like stopped halfway through uh because we just couldn't figure out what to do and we gave money back and they were just like what are you doing giving money back to us you yeah. know but we thought we were doing the right thing and i think a lot of people were like no like you're not ambitious enough you're not thinking big enough because we were like yeah. we don't know what to do with this money anymore here it is and they're like that wasn't the point of this so never right. give it back <laughs> right never give it back uh but then the second company you know i um started I, when we kind of got stuck, we actually pivoted and tried to do something else. And, you know, we, we spent all that money that time, second time. And, you know, we, we didn't have like a giant exit, but we did get the attention of Facebook or now Meta and they, they, you know, acquired the, the company and the team really not the sort of like, um, uh, product or, you know, our user base, or we weren't making a ton of money. So. I felt like that was part of my story as a, as someone who has resilience, you know, we, we can talk about the injury and, and the resilience I learned from that. And then the resilience of like first company failing, are you going to try again? Once you try again and you get stuck, like, are you going to try to change? Last time we tried to change it didn't even work. So trying again, and then finally doing that and making it through and getting on the other side of that. Um, but thinking big is, is so hard because if you don't have that safety net, right. If you don't have that, like, Hey, whatever, if this doesn't work out, my dad's got me or I got so many right. friends who work in there, they can give me a job tomorrow. Um, it, it, you always kind of hold back a little bit and that's tough. So yeah, let's talk about your injury at Stanford and the lessons that you learned from that. Yeah, so um, this was sort of the big injury that uh, changed the course of my athletic career. I was in my junior year, it was a big year for me. I was training this new vault. So vault is when you run down that runway and then you hit the springboard mm -hmm. and you, you kind of flip off. And so I'd been doing a, a vault that had one and a half twists for okay. uh, a couple of years. And over that summer, the summer's when you're kind of off season, you train, I had learned the double twist. The double twist was, you know, it's only half a twist more, but it was a big deal because the one and a half, you kind of land, your body's facing forward. And so if you are short, you just sit down, you sit down on your butt, no big deal. Right. But with the double twist, you're on the other side. So you're coming in and you're sort of your face is close to the ground. So if you're short, you can hurt your ankles, you know, the your knees. There's just a lot more sort of pressure on land on the landing for the double versus the one and a half. So it is a stepwise change. And, um, you know, I competed it in our first practice meet and, you know, landed OK. And then uh, I went to my next meet. And it was at Berkeley and, the, you know, that. In, in practice, you land on these big mats that are on top of a foam pit, so it's like softer, but the impact is much more aggressive in the, yeah. uh, you know, uh, competition floor where you're on basketball boards and then a couple mats, but they're really hard. So I was just a little bit off on the takeoff, and that was kind of enough. You know, I, I landed short. I landed, so I landed one and three quarters instead of double, and, you know, I kind of twisted into the ground, foot left foot still planted, and my knee dislocated my you know my foot was up by my hip you know wow. it, it looks real bad you know because you record all these clips right and so then you turn my face in the ground i'm screaming you know pain's at 11. uh everyone's running over they're trying to straighten out my leg and you know i, I basically tore everything acl pcl mcl lcl meniscus you know the whole nine yards two days later i'm in surgery they're reattaching my um MCL, LCL, right? The side ligaments. And then, right. you know, they're doing this thing where they, you know, you let that heal. And then once, you know, three, four months that go by and you're kind of healing, you're just getting to the point where you're walking, they're like, great, now we're going to take you back under again. <laughs> you're going to redo your ACL, PCL. So I did that with a cadaver, uh, kill sentence. Obviously my season is shot. So my junior year, I didn't compete at all. And just trying to heal through all these surgeries. And then, you know, they so told what kind me, of, like, what kind yeah. of conversations are you having with your position and with your coach at that point what are they telling you yeah this so we had it? our coach career? we had my my team doctor and then we had the orthopedic surgeon um and we worked with this guy named jason dragu um i don't know if he's still at stanford now but he you know he did a lot of these stuff they talked about like oh these pro soccer players wait until the office you know, he's available to do his their knees so he's really good 
And I think he's a former football player, so he had that sports background. And, you know, yeah, they, they, they tried to set the expectations like, look, you may not, we don't know how this is going to go. Maybe you won't walk or run normally again. This may be the end of your athletic career. I heard all that and I was immediately like, it's fine. You know, like this is my big comeback moment. Like I've, I almost felt like I was fated to have some kind of injury. I was like, I've been so lucky. I've had all these teammates of injuries and I've been like pretty good. And so when this happened, I was kind of like, all right, this is my, this is my time to like take this tough injury. And I've seen enough sports movies to know, like, you know, the hero makes the comeback. Right. And And so that was kind of how I went into it. I was just like, I felt very confident that I was going to come back in some way, shape or form and that I wanted to to show up for my teammates. So I didn't just kind of slink off away and kind of like didn't go. I still went to the gym most days, even though I wasn't really doing much. And I was kind of cheering on my teammates, helping them out, being a second pair of eyes to be like, hey, you kind of split your legs on that, you know, watch out for next time. But I didn't know. And it and it yeah, it took a full year for me to start doing some events again. And of course I never did the vault or floor or high bar or rings again, or, or yeah, I only did the parallel bars and the pommel horse, which were the lowest impact, you know, mm-hmm. no twisting on the dismounts. So just like nice solid landings. Um, so we competed my, my senior year. That was kind of a heartbreak season where we were ranked number one throughout the season. NCAAs was at home at Stanford. And then we kind of lost at the very end by a small margin and I had messed up a little bit and I felt bad. We all kind of, you know, lots of different people messed up, but just enough to, to lose it. But I got to stay a fifth year. So my, my injury was already a blessing because I got to stay a fifth year, continue to compete. And we got some great new talent that fifth year. Uh, and we ultimately did end up winning the NCAA championship first time for the team in 14 years. So really, yeah got that kind of Hollywood ending for, for my career with a, with a little bit of an asterisk. What did that feel like to go from, like you mentioned, this knee dislocation, foot by your head, you know, by your hip, to being able to get a championship medal? What did that moment feel like? I mean, it was, it was really a, a bittersweet moment because, you know, it was the end of my athletic career. I knew I was not going on to, to compete you know, in the, you know, U.S. senior national team or on the Olympic team. Um, And this was my last time with these guys, you know, being part of that team was such a huge part of my identity. And because I kind of re-injured my knee weeks before the final meet. And so Mm. um, I actually didn't step foot on the competition floor on the day of the last meet, you know, so my last competition was like a couple weeks before NCAAs. I was part of the team. I was a team captain, you know, and all that. But like, I did not contribute a score to our final outcome, right? And so that's why I say there's an asterisk there. There's still like a bit of like, you know, uh, I didn't, you know, I was only doing two events and I wasn't like the big guy on the team anymore. There are all these other guys. So like, our team was fine, right? And, And I, feel that I do deserve it, right? I got my championship ring right here. I'll show it to you for the, I don't know if is this video too, but yeah, kinda, yeah, yeah, you can kind of see, right? right? Yeah. yeah, you know, big fat, it's too big to fit on my finger, honestly. But yeah. like, yeah, there was, it was a bittersweet, you know, moment. Yeah, so do you still, as a resilience coach, how do you use not failures, but truly setbacks? How do you use your setbacks or the things that you had to overcome uh, to help other people now? Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing to remember when you're facing a setback or a moment of adversity is to remember that, um, you know, this will pass, right? Nothing bad lasts forever. Nothing good lasts forever. And so, but when you're going through something bad, you go, oh my God, is this it? Is my life just going to be this bad forever? And no, obviously that's not what's going to happen. You've made it through every other bad day that you've had in your life to this point. Maybe this is the baddest day yet. Um, but I think that's a good starting point. The second thing to remember is that it, I don't want to say that every, you know, you know, every adversity or every setback is somehow good for you, right? There are some things that don't need to ha- ever happen to somebody. Um, but that there is 
something that you can take away from this experience. You can both say like, hey, it might be better for you if, if this experience didn't happen and say, given where you are now, there are better and worse ways to respond. There are ways you can take something from this that will help you in the future. Uh, and to, to really like actively look for those things because I looked for those things. I said, you know, as someone who has you know, achieve things that they wanted in life, but also kind of been just short of them in some ways. Yeah. Uh, I think I can bring a sense of connection to my clients that I otherwise couldn't. If if you sort of live the perfect life, client goes, you don't you don't know, right? Like you don't know what it's like mm -hmm. to to kind of be disappointed in the ways that I've been disappointed. And and I think that that's part of why coaching is such a a calling for me is I want people to feel seen and heard and like there's someone who understands. I was thinking about how do you bring all of this together? And it might be through your coaching, you know, your career as a gymnast, startup capital, now the coaching piece. What's your five-year plan or what's your long-term plan um, for all your talents? Yeah, so, you know, I think my goal is in, the, in, in five years time to be sort of running, um, back to sort of my own firm, but not a venture backed company this time, this time kind of like hanging my shingle as a, as an individual and saying, Hey, um, I'm, I'm bringing something here. I've got a, a sort of place for a certain type of person or team. And the phrase that I've been coming back to a lot is helping people find the courage to make the leap. Um, and making the leap transcends a lot of different things in, in gymnastics, your coach, kind of helps you learn that new skill, that scary new skill that, and they're helping you, spotting you. And then one day they say, hey, this one's all you. I'm stepping aside, I'm not touching you. And that's that scary moment where you go like, do I really trust my coach? Do I really got this? And you're, the point of your coach is to help you have the courage to say, you got this, right? And then with startups, making the leap, quitting your job, you know, going off and doing this thing, asking people for money who you're looking them in the eye and say, hey, this could be a hundred extra for you. And then sometimes not doing it, right? But also to help people know, like, even when you miss your leap, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. You can try again, right? And and you can kind of come back from that. And so, you know, helping people make leaps, whether it's in a team as a, as a startup or as an individual who wants to try something different or be someone different, uh, reinvent themselves, you know, that's, that's really what I'm excited to do. And I'm, I'm, I'm starting to do that with some of the clients that I have today. And, and I hope that grows over the next couple of years. Yeah, I like that with making the leap. Um, you know, it's, that speaks a lot of volumes to me as I venture out into, you know, the world of real estate and venture out into the world of investments, which can be scary if you're not comfortable with it. You know, coming through formal training for medical school and going through residency, they teach you techniques, but they don't teach you necessarily even the business of medicine. They definitely don't teach you business outside of medicine. So it's about making that leap. Um, so, you know, on Time Out with the Sports Doctor, this is your final time out. So we're going to stick stick with the topic of making a leap. Speak with an individual who might not be comfortable with taking risk about why taking that leap is so important to fulfilling your full potential. Ooh, that's a big one. You ended me on, on, a, on a big one. Hey, you're an executive coach, so, you know, that's you're used right. to <laughs> Got to Gotta step up. No, I think yeah. that, you know, people who are listening to this know that I want them to know that there's something bigger inside of them than what they might have experienced so far. And what I want them to remember is that they can't really find out what big things are inside them without taking that leap. Right. And taking that leap sometimes means falling on their face. But you know what? Mm. It doesn't hurt as much as you think. You can get it up. You know, it, it the fall looks scarier than it really is 99% of the time. You know, if you're bungee jumping and, you know, yeah, the fall is real. But but for most of the things that we're kind of a little bit, you know, in our hearts feeling a little scared about. What I like to say is that what we're afraid of is often our sources of greatest growth, right? We're not afraid of doing dumb things. You know, they're dumb things that we don't, you don't yeah, think and you right. go, ooh, I kind of want to do that though, but it's scary, right? That, you know, yeah. you just like that, why would I ever do that? But it's the yeah. things that you go, man, I, I would like to do that, or I would like to find out if I could do that, but I don't know. 
and and so use that fear as your compass and point you towards that and so with every time you can practice stepping taking a step towards your fear instead of taking a step away from it that's how you like live that. a life that is really rich and really you know meaningful i like that well Derek, i gotta honest. ask you what do you think is something that oh, like that's go. scaring you right now like you know that uh, you know i know i know you're you usually asking the questions here but i'm kind of curious now it's coaching session now you know so it's just what i mentioned is step we're so used to in medicine being formally trained before you do anything and there's a saying of see one do one teach one um, but we're used to take a course take a test okay you pass good go to the next step take a course take a test you pass go to the next step that's not how business works it's sometimes start you know then take a course and take a test and you've already spent or you've already invested as you learn the lessons. So it's really overcoming that I need to know everything before I can start. And with this podcast, it's helped me because, I mean, I wasn't ready to launch when I launched, but I knew I had to start. And taking that first step, you can't get to your 100th episode before you have your first episode. And you can try to perfect that first episode as long as you want to. And it's not going to be perfect, no matter how much training you've had how many times you edited it, you have to, you, you can't replace experience. So that's one thing that I'm learning to not be perfect, but to take imperfect action. So that's been a big step for me. It's still something that I have to work with to, to not let um, the fear of failure, you know, paralyze me. I love that. I love that. And certainly, you know, you go to any podcast, anything that anybody that you admire and you go and you look at their first one, their first yeah. movie, their first song, their first website, like websites hide, but you can go to, you know, the Wayback Machine and look at websites when they first got started. You look at, you know, any website of any company you admire, their first version looks pretty dopey, looks pretty yeah. bad. And, you know, you got to get through some of the bad to get to the good. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So tell everyone, you know, people have probably been able to connect with your story and want to learn more about what you're doing, or maybe even want to connect with you as a coach. So tell people how they can find you and how they can connect with you. Yeah, uh, the best way to find me is from my website, jasonshen.com, J-A-S-O-N-S-H-E-N. I'm also at Jason Shen on Twitter, and you can search my name on YouTube to see some of my uh, content there. So those are three great places for folks to find me. Um, yeah. And thank you so much for having me on Derek. This is, this is so fun. Hey, thank you for coming on. And more importantly, thank you for inspiring me and I'm sure others that are list listening to make that leap. Appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank you for continuing to support this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, then please leave a five-star review. And if you haven't done so, subscribe so you continue to get the updated episode. Until later, peace. Trust you don't want to miss. This is where life, sports, and medicine.